Good afternoon. Uh, before I begin, I just want to say the student speakers today have been phenomenal. Uh, I think it's going to be difficult for me to match their performance. Let's give them a round of applause. All right, so uh, long time ago, uh, when I was studying in university uh, in the year 1999, my friends and I, we went out to watch a movie, and we couldn't stop talking about that movie for many days to come. It was shocking, and it was scary, but unlike many other scary movies, it was entirely plausible. So we, we spent days trying to figure out, uh, you know, plot holes or drill holes in its logic, but we couldn't. And I'm talking about the matrix. And this is where we are right now, actually. We are in the early 21st century, and if you've seen the movie, uh, you know that in less than 100 years from now, basically, the machines end up turning us into slaves and start harvesting us for energy. Uh, back then, I was kind of you know, comfortable in the assurance that, you know, AI was something that was really advanced and probably wouldn't happen in my lifetime, so I needn't worry about it. Uh, but AI has happened. And I'm wondering, now what? <laughs> right? Um, actually, we tend to be afraid of things that we don't fully understand, you know, powerful things that we don't really understand. So maybe the first step would be to start with trying to figure out how machines have come to think. And it all started with bits and binary logic. Uh, don't get scared. I'm not going to give you a lecture in computer science or history. It's just a few seminal points uh, in this evolution that I've uh, picked here. So we figured out a long time ago that we could use electric voltage to represent two states, on and off. And we could give them meanings, like, for example, on might be true and off might be false in the context of facts. And then we used uh, these states to also be able to represent some data, like numbers, using binary digits or bits, as we call them. And some smart people, they combined these concepts to come up with Boolean logic, which is you know, the logic that deals with true and false statements and their combinations. And we could use this logic to perform basic arithmetic, you know, addition, subtraction, stuff like that. And then once we were able to do that, some other smart mathematicians came up with a technique called numerical methods, which allowed them to do more advanced mathematics using basic arithmetic. And we also figured out how to represent text using bits. And so we entered the age of text processing and algebra in computers. But so far, this was all you know, calculations and you know, very calculator kind of stuff. Uh, sometime later, the statisticians figured out that since they could do advanced algebra on computers, they could actually use data to compute probabilities. And they taught computers essentially how to guess. And that turned out to be very useful. You know, instead of just answering very specific questions, computers could now answer approximate questions. Like, for example, while doing a search, if you don't find an exact match, what could be the most similar thing that you're looking for? Or in, t in case of spam filtering, you know, just looking at an email and trying to guess whether it is spam or not spam. Or trying to figure out what's going to happen to the weather the next day. And this was all very nice, but it still required us to understand the statistics and then code the statistics and the patterns uh, into the computers until we got around to machine learning. Now, these machine learning programs are really advanced. What they do is basically they scan a huge amount of data, what we call as big data, and they try to figure out the patterns that exist within that data. We do not have to tell them what patterns to look for. They figure it out themselves by scanning the data and running all these probability equations. And this has turned out to be extremely helpful in applications like you know, image classification. For example, showing an image to a computer and making it guess whether it's a cat or a dog or something else. Uh, it's also helpful in making predictions, such as if we have 
consumed certain content in the past or we've done some activities in the past, what is it that we are more likely to do next? Uh, and so that bu builds the foundation of news feeds and recommendations and so on that we are very familiar with. And then we come to generative AI. Um, since generative AI is actually capable of speaking for itself, I thought it might be a good idea to let it do that. And so here I have something that the AI wrote about itself, which I'm going to read out. Now we have the ability to condense all of human knowledge digitized as text into a single disk. The entirety of our recorded knowledge and the internet reduced to less than 50 terabytes of text. We've built a class of machines called transformers, inspired by the architecture of human brains. These transformers don't just discover patterns, like machine learning. They compute the relationships between every word and phrase. Through this process, they develop statistical models of language, learning word meanings, connections, and contextual variations. Once trained on this enormous data set, these machines represent everything they've learned as a model. A model is a giant probabilistic mathematical equation with billions of terms. When we ask a question, the model doesn't just retrieve pre-written answers like search engines. Instead, it applies this equation to generate responses that fit the context, much like completing a thought in a conversation. This is generative AI, technology that creates rather than retrieves. AI that can write code, craft essays, and tell stories. AI that can translate languages, solve problems, and hold coherent, meaningful conversations. This narrative was written by a combination of two AIs. So AI is actually really powerful, but I think what we've learned just now is that machines do not think. They calculate and they guess. But thinking is a human projection. It's something that we project onto the AI. Machines do not think, they do not have feelings, and do, they do not have intentions. There are some other pitfalls you know, of our expectations from AI. Uh, one is that coherence does not mean comprehension. If the AI is able to generate some text that seems coherent, seems logical, does not necessarily mean that the machine that has generated that text actually understands what it is generating, or what it is saying. For example, if you show a picture of a cat to a machine that can identify the cat, does not necessarily mean that it knows what a cat is. It just means that, you know, that image, that pattern of pixels is what somebody has identified as a cat. The other misconception or misplaced expectation from AI is that of correctness. Uh, confidence does not mean correctness. AI is trained to generate text in a way that sounds confident, but it may not always be correct. In fact, uh, there is an interesting example while I was just preparing for this uh, talk. I wanted to reference a particular race um, that I didn't remember the details of, but I just gave the background to the AI. And it said that the race happened in Morocco. It was run by an Italian rally champion called Guia Maria de Sanctis. And I would have believed that, except that I kind of remembered that the driver was actually British. That, and also the fact that the name literally means our guide, Mary the Saint. So. <laughs> It, it, took, it took quite a few variations uh, or iterations before the, the AI could figure out which race I was actually talking about. It was run by Abby Eaton, a British driver, and the race actually happened in Azerbaijan. So that's, you know, that's one of the pitfalls of AI, because they're, they're trying to guess. They have a repository of facts, but they are generating answers based on what they think is the most plausible response to our queries. They may sometimes get things wrong. Uh, and it is called hallucination, which is a bit of a misleading term. But that's, that's fine. I mean, computer industry traditionally has a problem with terminology. You know, in computers, we have trees 
that have their roots at the top, and then the branches grow downward, and then we have leaves of those trees at the bottom. So when you know, computer scientists, they give you a term, it does not necessarily mean what we take it to mean. <laughs> so when they say things like chain of thought, or attention, or prediction, it doesn't really mean what we think it means. For example, I might say, I predict that it's going to rain tomorrow. And then if it doesn't rain tomorrow, you're going to tell me I was wrong. But if I say, I predict there is a 57% chance of rain tomorrow, then you'll say, that's not a prediction. You're guessing. You're estimating. It's a guesstimate, right? So I think this, this misleading terminology in the computer industry has set up some very misleading kind of expectations also from AI. And it kind of leads to confusion at best, but also bad, bad decisions in the worst case. And talking about quality of output, uh, the output of the AI depends a lot on the quality of input. Now, so far, AI has been trained on good quality human output. But increasingly, we are seeing that uh, the output from AI with all the hallucinations, the correct term for that is confabulation, but let's call it hallucinations, with all the hallucinations and all of that stuff, is getting increasingly mixed with human output. And so there's a possibility or a danger that in future, the AI that gets trained on this data might actually have even lower quality. And so we, we get into this reduction of quality over time. Uh, speaking of input and training and all that, there is one other disturbing fact that I discovered. Uh, well, I was trying to design a hypothetical programming language based on my favorite bits from other programming languages using AI. And I noticed over a period of time that the AI was trying to push a certain programming language more than others. And I didn't expect that to happen, so I told it, if you were a person, I would say that you're biased towards this programming language. And to my shock and surprise, the AI acknowledged that, yes, it was biased. And that was because its training data set contained advocacy for that specific programming language more than others. So what we expect is that because it's AI, because it's a machine, we've historically had computers always give us correct answers. If AI says something, it has to be correct, it has to be unbiased, it has to be fair. But actually, if you feed biased data into AI, the AI will get biased as well. And it's not just biased data, it's also about pro uh, popularity. If something is more popular, the AI will be biased towards it. So that, that basically means that there are pitfalls uh, to... to you know, using AI for the things that we kind of expect them to be usable for. Uh, and those pitfalls have to be kept in mind. So, over the course of the past few years, I've been, uh, you know, I've been reflecting on how I'm, I've been using AI. And even though so far it seems like you know, I'm not really enthusiastic about it, I've actually started using more and more uh, over the past few years to the extent that now I pay for it, just like I pay for electricity or internet. So AI is great, it's actually really helpful. But then we see that you know, we are increasingly kind of addicted to our smartphones and our algorithms and news feeds, and I see that the AI is feeding me with updates and the news and shaping my worldview. And I wonder, is the prophecy of the metrics gonna come true? But I don't think that's going to happen because, as we just discovered, machines don't have intentions. So the machines cannot intend to enslave us. And that's a relief, you know, after so many years of feeling scared about the, the possible out outcome that was outlined in, in, in the movie The Matrix. It seems like that's probably not going to happen. But then what good is a scary story without a plot twist and a cliffhanger? You know, so far, I used, to, I used to say that The Matrix is the best movie ever until another movie came out, and it was Dune. Dune was written 60 years ago, before all of this AI stuff actually happened. And here's a scary twist 
from that movie. The danger is not whether machines are going to enslave us. The danger is whether the people who own these machines have that capability. Let's use our brains, stay sharp, and use AI. Thank you.